Thanks, Jenny. Um, so I would like to um, welcome, obviously, one of our past mem members. Uh, we tried to do that this year, where the incoming members um, were given the opportunity to sort of present to the community um, as to their research focus. Um, so today we have uh, Dr. Zhang Feng Ling. Um, he completed his PhD at Columbia University in physical oceanography in 2012 followed by a postdoc at MIT from 2012 to 2015. Um, he was an assistant professor at the University of South Florida uh, from 2016 to 2019, and is currently an assistant professor at the University of Delaware in the School of Marine Science and Policy. His main research interest is using a combination of observations, numerical models, and theory to understand how the ocean works and how the ocean is affected by and response to the changing climate. So this includes influence of mesoscale eddies on the physical, biological, and geological processes in the deep ocean, and vertical transport of heat, salt, and other tracers, and its variation within the climate. So we are so glad to have Zeng Feng as one of our POS panel members and our speaker today. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over, um, and he will be talking about vertical redistributions of the global oceanic heat and salt contents. Thank you so much. Thank you for the very nice uh introduction and uh, I'm very glad to have this opportunity uh, to share uh, some research uh, my, my group has been doing over the past few years. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's about the vertical redistributions of the global oceanic heat and salt content. Uh, this is the outline of my talk. Uh, I will start with a little bit of background um, uh, to see why uh, kind of the motivation to, to look at the, the vertical uh, transport of the fluxes of salt and the content. After that, I will uh, kind of talk a little bit about the tools uh, I have been using. Uh, that's the ocean synthesis product. Uh, and then I will present some results about what you call heat and salt fluxes from one particular one. Uh, that's the echo ocean state estimate, which uh, Patrick Hanback uh, gave a very nice uh, uh, introduction a couple of weeks ago. And at the end, it's a very short conclusion of the, uh, the major results and the uh, implications of those results. So uh, let's start with the motivation. Uh, why do we care about ocean heat content? Uh, there are actually a lot of studies uh, talk about the, uh, the, the, the importance of ocean heat, heat, heat content. It's important in various ways. Here, I just kind of list one, well, two of them. Uh, the first is, uh, we know that the, uh, let's look at this figure, for instance, this figure summarized a number of uh, uh, kind of uh, studies on the up ocean heat content change after 1950. And you can see that uh, after uh, like 1970, all the results show a pretty robust uh, warming trend, which is used as the one of the major evidence to support that the, uh, the earth has been warming since then. Uh, but if you look at the uh, the details of those very those studies on the upper ocean heat content, which is the uh, relatively well observed part of the ocean, you will see there are quite significant discrepancies between different uh, product. So that means even for the relatively well observed upper ocean, the uncertainty part is still pretty big. Uh, so first, it's used as the evidence uh, of global warming. Uh, the second is uh, the ocean heat content change uh, has been used as the uh, main, major constraint for estimating the, uh, the imbalance, the, the radiation imbalance at the top of the atmosphere, uh, which is a, a kind of a, a very important for, estimate, for estimating the sensitivity of the whole climate system uh, to the increasing greenhouse gases. So uh, then, uh, then let's uh, look at the, uh, the the importance of ocean salt content. Uh, again, this uh, figure from the IPCC EI five, and the uh, the first show you the uh, the pattern of the sea surface salinity, uh, the long term mean pattern for sea surface salinity, and the second panel show you the uh, the mean E minus P, uh, uh, the evaporation minus precipitation, which is directly linked to the global water cycle. You can see a very good uh, relationship between them. And then if we uh, care about climate change or global water cycle change over a pretty long time scale, we look at the SSA, SSS changes, you find a very good relationship between uh, the change and the mean SSS. 
So that's that's kind of where uh, we get the quite well known conclusion that the uh, the salt uh, region get saltier, fresh region get fresher. So uh, basically, uh, we can use uh, salinity information to infer something information about, about the global water cycle and its changes, which is very difficult to measure directly. Uh, also, we know that both the, uh, the heat content change uh, and the salt content change or salinity change, they both contribute to, to sea level rise. So uh, they are quite important in the climate change sense. Uh, the, the, the most reliable way to kind of uh, uh, to get the information about the, uh, the the ocean heat content change or salt content changes through measurements. And for the upper ocean uh, here, I, I roughly divide, uh, define it as the layer above 2,000 meters. Uh, we have, at least in the past few, few decades, we have pretty good uh, observation, uh, uh, mainly thanks to the, uh, the development of the Ar global Argo away. And here is kind of the latest uh, map uh, showing the spatial distribution of the Argo floats around the globe. And you can see that uh, it's, the coverage is pretty good and the distribution is also uh, pretty nice. So uh, from here, uh, largely from those Argo floats, you can get uh, a lot of data uh, for the up 2,000 meters uh, continuously and uh, around the global ocean. Because the amount of uh, uh, available data, so the confidence about the up 2,000 meter is, uh, is, is relatively good. Uh, if we focus on the layer uh, below 2,000 meter, which is the deep and the basal ocean, uh, the story is very different. Uh, for that layer, what we have, particularly for the global studies, uh, mainly from the uh, hydrographic, repeated hydrographic uh, measurement, uh, along those sections, along those uh, sectors. Uh, this, this is a go ship uh, map showing where those uh, repeated hydrographic uh, measurement sections are. Uh, the deep, for, the, for the deep ocean information, particularly the changes, we only get those information, uh, mainly get those information from uh, measurement along those sections. Uh, so, just visually compare this, this map and the previous one, that's the Argo distribution, you can see uh, the data amount uh, for the two different layers are significantly different. And we have way more or less data in the layer below 2,000 meters. So um, the confidence about the, uh, the changes in the deep, deep and basal ocean uh, is, is not as high as for the upper ocean. To quantify this uh, the sparseness of the observation uh, in the layer below 2,000 meter, uh, here I just got some uh, some numbers from a paper by Chen Hanbeck uh, in 2014. Uh, they they kind of uh, uh, first they define uh, a, a box uh, six time uh, 60 kilometer times 60 kilometer box is observed if you have one CDD station existed within that box. So over this time period, about 20 year period, between 1992 to 2011, uh, this is a, the, the, the ratio of the volume uh, being observed. Um, and, you, and you can see that below 2,000 meter, about 21% of the water, uh, water volume uh, was observed once over that time period. But if you care about the changes, you need at least two observation uh, two within the same box. And then the number you can see here, actually only 1.4% of the water volume below 2,000 meter uh, was observed more than once, which you can use to infer information about the, uh, the changes. Uh, if we look even more deeper, like the basal ocean, the ratio is even smaller. So you can see, uh, the information we get about the deep ocean changes based on such a limited observation uh, ha definitely has pretty big uncertainties. So that uncertainty is pretty difficult to, uh, to quantify. Here, uh, kind of come to the reasons why uh, I, I kind of want to start study the, the vertical fluxes. 
And this is a diagram basically summarize uh, the kind of uh, the relationship between the upper ocean and the deep ocean. We know the upper ocean uh, is relatively well observed. So we have a better idea about what's going on in the upper ocean. But for the deep ocean, it's poorly observed. So we don't have a lot of knowledge about the deep ocean. There are few uncertainties with existing studies about deep ocean changes. So the way to connect the upper ocean and deep ocean is through the, uh, the fluxes, all the, uh, the fluxes between the upper ocean and deep ocean. So if you care about the ocean heat content, uh, this, this is gonna be the vertical heat flux. If you care about the uh, salt content, they're gonna be the salt flux or freshwater flux. Uh, another thing is uh, we know there are huge number of uh, studies talk about the ASC exchanges, uh, ASC heat fluxes, ASC freshwater fluxes. But compared to that, we really, uh, when you look at the literature, there are very small number of studies talk about the, uh, the vertical heat and salt fluxes inside the ocean. So the reason uh, uh, is mainly because we don't have very good observation uh, inside the ocean, particularly for the terms which you need to, to kind of uh, examine the vertical fluxes, such as the vertical velocity and the vertical mixing. Uh, so, but, but if we have uh, some kind of uh, good understanding about this term, uh, we can connect the upper ocean and deep ocean, we can better understand the upper ocean changes and potentially can infer some information about deep ocean changes. The the situ I mean I just mentioned we because the decades decades ago we don't have direct measurement or don't have even estimate of a lot of uh, variables we need to estimate the vertical fluxes but the situation changed uh, over the past decades nowadays uh, there are a huge number of uh, ocean reanalysis product or somebody prefer to call them ocean synthesis product available. Uh, which basically combine uh, numerical models, uh, ocean general circulation models, and uh, observation data. I mean, uh, different group may use different kind of uh, uh, observational data. They combine the observational data and the numerical model to produce uh, kind of uh, uh, easy to use uh, uh, all kind of variables. And those uh, there are three different uh, uh, kind of uh, Factors you can you can kind of use to divide them. Uh, one particular important factor in my mind is the data assimilation method. Based on the the way they assimilate the data with the model, uh, all those corrosion synthesis product can be uh, roughly divided into two groups. Uh, one group of the ocean reanalysis product kind of uh, uh, like the uh, the red and the black curve. Which basically you use a model, make kind of a, uh, you run the model, you make uh, get some numbers, then compare those uh, model simulation with the observation, then you adjust the the the, the, the estimate, then make another next uh, make a forecast for next step. So uh, you you will follow kind of a, a curve like this, and you can imagine when when the user uses those data. Uh, they, they will find a lot of interesting signals, but it's really difficult to, to see whether those signals are due to the adjustment process or they are real signals in the, in the climate system. Another way to, uh, to do those kind of data simulation is use the adjunct method, uh, which will give you uh, more like estimate following those blue curves. Uh, all the estimate will, follow the, will be forced to follow the control equations. In the meantime, they will, 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 uh, will kind of uh, uh, to match the data as close as possible. But at least you get something that follow the control equations uh, almost perfectly. So anything you see in that particular kind of uh, estimate, uh, you find it interesting, you can use all the other variables or either forcing to understand the features there. So uh, the, the, the one, I have been using the the, uh, the echo ocean state estimate, which basically uh, is the second uh, category I mentioned, uh, which uh, all the estimates in the echo estimate following the control equations is uh, people call it dynamically consistent. That means you can use 
if you find something interesting, you can use the force, you can use the, the other variables to explain it uh, perfectly. And the budget is beautifully closed. Uh, so it's very, very, which is a very important feature to uh, understand the ocean heat content and salt content. And in the meantime, uh, echo assimilate uh, an intensive amount of data, like uh, the Argo array data, Argo flows data, and the Vols and Goose shape hypergraphic measurement, and the satellite data from uh, like the altimeter uh, data, and even uh, the the grease data, which I think is the the, the bottom pressure data. So it, it, it assimilate an intensive amount of uh, observation. They agree with the observation pretty good. So uh, let's jump to the, the result part. Uh, here, all the results are based on the echo version four. First, the vertical heat redistribution. Uh, we first look at the, uh, the LC heat exchange uh, over a 20 year time period. And uh, here you can see, uh, this show you a 20 year mean of the ALC heat exchange. Uh, blue means the ocean receive heat, red means the ocean release heat to the atmosphere. And then you can see, uh, it's quite a conventional pattern that the ocean receive heat at low latitudes and lo lose it at high latitudes. And also, you can see the, the western boundary current are quite important. If you look at the numbers, so you see uh, the, 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 the spatial variation, those, those ALC heat exchanges is quite big. It can be up to like more than 200 watts per meter square. But if you do a the mean of the spatial mean, you get a net uh, ocean heat uptake for that particular time period. About uh, the number is about zero zero point three uh, water per meter square. So that the ocean indeed received heat from the atmosphere for that time period, but the spatial variations are huge. So you can imagine in reality when you measure this, you will get a huge uncertainty with the estimate you get. Uh, the here should show the temporal variation uh, to show where you have very strong temporal variability of the ASC heat exchange. Now let's jump into the ocean interior. Uh, in the ocean interior, the vertical heat flux in ECHO is calculated uh, like this. Uh, it, it consists of two parts. The first is a, a directive part and the diffusive part. Uh, the directive part basically includes two, two Components. One is the uh, the mean circulation, that's a W, and the other is the uh, W star, which represents the bolus velocity, uh, which is is prime tries any contribution. Uh, for the diffusive part, you have the uh, contribution from the isopicnol mixing and dipicnol mixing. The reason we have those uh, uh, isopicnol contribution is all the calculation will be on the same depths, like 100 meter, 200 meter, 300 meters. So the uh, isopicnol mixing actually had a pretty big contribution to that. Then we look at the result. Uh, the, here are the result from two layers. Uh, one is near the surface, the other is in the deep ocean. And you can see near the surface, the mean of the uh, vertical heat flux show a pattern that's basically consistent with the vertical, with, with the, uh, the mean circulation pattern. You have uh, heat pushed down to the, to push down to the ocean uh, in these uh, subtropical ocean basins, which related to the vertical upwelling, a uh, downwelling uh, patterns. But if you go to the deep ocean, the patterns are significantly different from the surface. Uh, you can see that in the deep ocean, most of the heat exchange actually occur in the Southern Ocean as well as the North Atlantic Ocean. So uh, if you go even deeper, we really show you roughly the same pattern. So in the deep ocean or the ocean interior, the, the high latitude regions are where the most of the vertical heat exchange occur. The right panel again show you the temporal variability. If, uh, I, here I just skip it. We also look at the contribution from the advective part and diffusive part, which represents the contribution of the different dynamical processes. Here I just choose a, a sample depth of 700 meters, and here the total, that's in the net vertical uh, heat fluxes, here is a directing part that's related to the vertical velocity, the mean circulation, as well as the prime tries uh, mesoscope eddy contribution. And here I show you the contribution from diffusivity, both isopicnol and dipicnol diffusivity. And you can see that if you look at the region, the regional pattern is very much similar 
uh, between the net and the uh, uh, the vector term, they are much basically the same. That means the regional pattern of the vertical heat flux inside the ocean is controlled by the, uh, the vector processes. And the diffusive are not that important regionally, except a few uh, highlighted regions. Okay. Uh, it, but if we do a global integral of that, we get a pattern like this. This is basically the total vertical flux in the deep ocean. And you can see the, 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 the directive part in uh, above like uh, 3,500 meters uh, negative. That means the uh, mean circulation eddies actually push heat down into the deep ocean. On the other hand, the diffusive term is positive uh, for most of part. Uh, the reason you have a positive diffusive heat flux inside the ocean is actually due to the uh, the isopignol mixing uh, in the high latitude regions. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, well, we can talk later about that, this, or you can read the literature I listed at the end of the talk. Um, one another quite interesting pattern here is the uh, the, the total vertical uh, total net. Uh, vertical heat flux is actually positive in the deep ocean. Uh, that means if you have a, if arbitrary choose a depth, for instance, two thousand meters, in this particular estimate, you will have a heat passing that depth and reach to the upper upper layer and contribute to the warming of the upper layer. So this is a kind of a surprising and a, and a kind of a controversial uh, because let's go this. Because in this particular estimate, that means the up portion warming, which is warming, and everybody know that, it's not purely due to the the heat the get uh, the ocean get from the atmosphere, but actually some part of the, the warming is due to the internal redistribution uh, from deep ocean to the up ocean. It's kind of surprising, but if you consider the fact that the ocean was never uh, really in an equilibrium state, and it has a it could be still adjusting to climate events happened hundreds or even thousands of years ago, particularly in the deep ocean. So it has a memory of those cold events. So if you only focus on the time period, like 20 or 30 years, it's as least as possible. So considering the less uh, observation we have in the deep ocean, we just want to bring this up and you, you, the, the possible contribution of the internal redistribution to the to the uh, uh, the well observed apportion changes. So here the uh, the the summary of that: the vertical movement of heat shows complex spatial patterns, confirming the ocean is not a passive reservoir but an active heat exchanger. The global second is global integral shows a net upward heat transport in deep ocean. Part of the observed apportion warming could be due to the vertical redistribution of uh, ocean heat. And for this particular product over this particular time period, the deep ocean cooled. Uh, and considering the uh, the long memory of the ocean, it's it's a pos it, it's a possible scenario. And we need to dig more about that. And regionally, uh, the directive uh, processes, circulation eddies, is more important. But globally, both the directive and the diffusive processes are important for the uh, vertical heat balance, heat transport. So the the vertical uh, the vertical salt redistribution here, um, many of the uh, the result are pretty much the same. So I will go through it quickly. So this first we start with the surface fresh water and surface salt flux, uh, which basically a very conventional patterns uh, uh, consistent with many previous studies show that uh, it's directly related to the e minus p pattern in the surface and the salt flux. Uh, as mainly related to the melting of the, the sea ice at, at the high latitude region. When go to the interior of the ocean, the vertical salt transport basically gave us the same conclusion as the vertical heat transport. Uh, first of all, uh, at different depths, uh, you, will, you will have very different spatial patterns. But one robust thing is uh, in the deep ocean, uh, the southern ocean, the North Atlantic Ocean are the regions where you will uh, have a lot of vertical salt exchange. And if you focus on the, if you look at the uh, the, the contribution from the, uh, the vective part and diffusive part, 
again, we find that uh, the regional pattern of the vertical soft transport is mainly controlled by the advective term, that's the mean circulation and the edit. Uh, the diffusive part are not that important regionally, except uh, the high latitude region again. Uh, if you do the integral, and again, to kind of look at the budget, uh, we found that, uh, adapt, again, for the advective part, uh, the mean circulation and eddies actually push salt uh, down to the deep ocean, and the diffusive part will kind of transport salt upward in the ocean. So uh, if you look at the net, uh, that's the global mean of the net vertical salt transport, uh, you have kind of interesting vertical structures which are responsible for layered change, change of structure of salinity. So similar to the, uh, we, we can think about uh, the up ocean change and deep ocean change uh, with this kind of a simple box. And here in the, uh, in the deep ocean, we, we found kind of, uh, in this layer, for instance, we found upward salt transport about like 600, 600 meters, okay? And we know the up ocean uh, has been freshening uh, Many previous studies already show that abortion is being freshening, and which part part of that is due to the net fresh water input from the surface. And here there's a net salt transport into the upper ocean. That means these uh, upward water salt transport actually uh, compensate the fresh water input from the surface. So if some people want to use the upper ocean salinity change to infer this they really need to take into account of this term. Otherwise, I have a pretty big uh, uh, error uh, bar for this, uh, for the estimates of the threshold input. Well, here's the uh, summary of the vertical redistri redistribution for salt. Again, the vertical movement of salt shows a very complex visual patterns, uh, confirming that the ocean is not a passive reservoir. But a lot of uh, active processes going on inside the ocean. And those are, uh, we, 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 will see that, we, we already see that the crucial region for the upper and deep ocean has changed, particularly in the deep ocean with the high latitude regions. And the global integral shows net upward salt transport in the upper ocean, and the upper salt transport to the upper ocean co actually compensates the, the freshening induced by the net fresher import input, which related to the melting of a glacier. Um, and the regional pattern, again, this is very uh, much the same to the vertical heat content. That's the regional pattern is largely determined by the directed term. Um, the diffusive term is not that important regionally, but they, uh, they become significant when we do the global integral. Uh, here is a kind of the uh, conclusion. Uh, we, we see that the vertical redistribution of heat and salt actually are uh, quite important for inferring information about climate change and variability from ocean observations, uh, particularly for the, uh, the upper ocean, which we, we believe is relatively observed, okay? And also the vertical redistribution of ocean properties uh, involve the very complex ocean dynamics, uh, particularly vertical velocity and isopycnal mixing. And uh, for, for those, I think more research is needed, especially nowadays, we have so many uh, ocean uh, synthesis products available, which at least provide a lot of information about vertical velocity. Uh, we can use, use, how we can make better use of the existing uh, ocean synthesis product to, uh, to look at the kind of robust more re most reliable information about those dynamical processes, which are uh, important for the vertical transport of heat and salt. And also, uh, we know in the future, uh, now the Deep Argo and the other programs uh, will help us to get more information about deep ocean. So those, those deep ocean observations will help to further improve our understanding about the, because it provides a better constraint for the ocean estimates and ocean reanalysis. So, excuse me, to will help uh, improve our understanding on the vertical redistribution and the related dynamics.
out here, just like already mentioned that we can how to uh, kind of relate the question, how to better use the existing data and the people put a lot of efforts in producing that, um, how we can use them uh, to address the question that's, uh, e that's used to very difficult to address. Um, oh, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, most of the result actually from those two papers uh, for people who are interested that they can uh, relate. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Xinfeng. Uh, so, a reminder if you have a question, use the raise your hand button or you can type it into the chat box. Um, so, with that, I do see a question from Li Qing. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is Li Qing from NCEI. Very nice presentation. Uh, I just find the results a little bit uh, counterintuitive because in this, we know that in the ocean, the surface water is very warm. And as it goes down, it's really cold. There are also exchanges like upwelling, downwelling. I mean, if we think of this way, when water goes up and the warm water goes down, cold water goes up, the deeper water should be warming, right? And now it seems like uh, actually the heat is transporting from a colder water to a warm water. And also we have the North Atlantic deep water formation. It's a very effective way of transporting heat downward. So, so I'm wondering if to, to confirm your results, do you have basically your your results is going to infer that the deep ocean is cooling? Do you have uh, observations to confirm that? Thanks. Uh, the, the the thing is, I mean, uh, first of all, we don't want to state that this is definitely true. Uh, we want to see this is one possible scenario, particularly considering the huge uncertainty of the uh, deep ocean uh, estimates we have nowadays. Uh, but the 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 possibility. I mean, I here I want to point out the uh, the 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 cooling in deep ocean is possible. The the reason is the scenario you just mentioned is uh, if the ocean if the ocean was in equilibrium uh, with the atmosphere before the global warming happened or before people put a, a tremendous amount of CO two into the atmosphere, then that's the case. I mean, you have warming and the ocean was in equilibrium with the atmosphere. Then you add heat, extra heat to the ocean. The heat will go down. Then you will see a warming from surface to the to the bottom, and you have more warming in the surface, uh, less warming in the deep ocean. And basically, through kind of a a, a concept like a diffusive process. But the the problem is, if the ocean was never really in equilibrium with the ocean, or with the atmosphere, so uh, it, it it could have some kind of if we think about. Uh, the time uh, the uh, people start to put uh, greenhouse gas into the atmosphere, it already has some kind of, it, it already responds to events happened uh, before that, like a little ice age. So it, it, the information was actually included in the kind of initial condition, you think that way at that time. So it still respond to something happened a long time ago. If you look at the, the, the spatial map of the, uh, the temperature change or ocean heat content change in, in echo, you will find the most of the cooling actually uh, occur in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and for the Atlantic Ocean, it's it's almost every, everywhere in the world, but for the Pacific Ocean, it, it still shows some kind of a cooling trend in the deep deep part. Uh, considering the, the, the Pacific Ocean, the deep Pacific Ocean has the longest uh, memory of any water, Mass, you know, get to the ocean it will take a very long time to reach the uh, uh, a kind of a deeper Pacific Ocean. So it's it's likely uh, the deeper Pacific Ocean still responding to uh, climate events like a little ice age. Actually, last year I think there's a paper in Science uh, also talk about this, uh, just like uh, talk about the uh, the deep ocean cooling the Pacific Ocean. So. Uh, I don't know whether I kind of uh, address this. this. We just want to see this is a possibility, uh, considering the uh, the long memory of the ocean, and also if you look at the patterns, it seems that the Pacific Ocean does show a cooling trend, and which kind kind of consistent with a few other studies. We have a question chat box by Fred Bingham. He says the 0 0.3 watts per square meter imbalance in heat in the upper 2000 meters. What rate of sea level rise does it imply? Oh, I never, I, I, I never look at that. Uh, 
directly. I, I think there are a bunch of people work already done, use Echo to look at the sea level rise. I, never, I, I, I don't remember the, the number of that. But one thing I want to point out is that uh, the number, uh, uh, look at the later features, uh, same the LC heat exchange or the QNET estimate has a pretty big uh, uh, kind of a range. Uh, the estimate in ECHO kind of within that range close to the low bound of that. So I assume because you have a lower uh, uh, QNET total input to the ocean, you, you're going to get a smaller, maybe smaller total uh, heat expansion uh, part of the sea level rise for that particular time period. Uh, uh, but one thing I want to point out is uh, another thing is the, the QNET estimating echo uh, actually did a work uh, with Li San Yu from Hui uh, to compare the uh, QNET estimate from echo and a few other uh, kind of analysis product. Uh, we found that uh, echo cr at least correct a few well-known problem uh, in the uh, in the other product because the echo QNET estimate is actually a, a kind of a control uh, control parameter, so it adjusted the QNET estimate to ma to better match uh, the the ocean uh, variable like temperature salinity to observation. So the the QNET estimating echo is actually an adjusted one. It's not directly get from uh, from other uh, like uh, atmospheric reanalysis products. I see a couple of uh, questions in the chat box too. So is it okay if we uh, keep you a little longer? Sure, no problem. Okay. So Allison Gray asked, thanks for the great talk. How do the temperature and salinity changes you see in the deep ocean compare to those calculated directly from observations, such as Perky and Johnson's work? Uh, for the uh, for the temperature one, uh, I, I, Carl, Carl has a paper uh, with Patrick in 2014. Uh, like like I mentioned here, the net uh, if you do the global mean, it show quite a, it shows some kind of a difference because I think Perkin and Johnson show the deep ocean is warming. Uh, the global global deep ocean is warming, but in Echo, uh, Cow and uh, Patrick's work show a little bit cooling. But the, the magnitude are very very small. They all kind of close to zero. Uh, but if you look at the spatial pattern of them, they are very much the same. Uh, you look at the spatial pattern where you have cooling, where you have warming, they are much, pretty much the same, except that the estimated from ECHO, you have much more fine, uh, kind of fine structures uh, in the heat content change. It's understandable because in Perkin and Johnson paper, they just use the, the hydrographic measurement, which basically you can only do a, a kind of a basin or sub-basin estimate to get patches, patches, but in ECHO, uh, because you have those uh, dynamical uh, present, uh, dynamical variabilities in the deep ocean, you can get a fine uh, some kind of fine structures there. But the large scale pattern uh, are very much the same, uh, to my understanding. For the salinity one, uh, salinity one, we did have a, kind of in the in, in the second paper list here. Uh, we look at the salinity change uh, in the deep ocean. It seems. Uh, there are, basic, there are not much studies look at the deep ocean salinity change because the uncertainty are huge. But for the upper uh, uh, ocean salinity change, uh, the echo uh, match the other result uh, pretty good, particularly the upper, I think, up to 700 meters, they match with the other Argo, particularly the Argo, graded Argo data pretty well. Uh, and a question from Monique. Related to the question of unexpected heat transfer from the deep from the deep to ocean surface or to, from the deep to surface ocean, would it be possible to estimate the age of the deep waters to figure out whether the climate was warmer or cooler at that time? That's a good question. Uh, I actually a uh, long time ago when I was a postdoc. Uh, uh, it seems the the people at MIT. Uh, was kind of a plan to run a very uh, basically use the echo uh, echo configuration to run it uh, like thousands of years. I think in that way you can potentially uh, trace back the signal. Uh, I mean, at least you can see if you you have some cooling uh, some climate event at the particular region or over the surface, how long it would take 
to the to the uh, to the deeper Pacific Ocean, but uh, but I don't know whether it it has been done. Uh, but before that, people did use MIT GCM to do similar studies and like to try to give you a sense of uh, uh, the time it takes for surface uh, climate signal to reach a different part of the ocean. I think uh, oh, just one last question then from Allison, and then I think we should wrap up. Um, she asks another question if there's time. Do you know if Echo is currently assimilating the existing deep Argo data? Oh, I, I know at least for for Echo version one, two, three. I don't think so. The latest one, I haven't checked the detail. I hope they're doing that, but I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah, but the, the one I have been using, I think they they haven't done that. But they just have a new one come out fairly recently. I'm not sure whether they they, they simulate that. I hope they do. But uh, if they do, I hope we, we, we will see whether there's significant change in the deep ocean. All right, so we should wrap up here. Um, thank you, Xin Feng, for giving us this talk, and thank you to all of our participants for joining in. Our next pause panel webinar is a month from now on October 1st, so I hope to see you then. Um, once again, thank you everyone for participating.